Welcome to the Department of Energy's 2019 Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month celebration. My name is Marilyn Matarang, past president of DOE's Asian American and Pacific Islander Network, or APIN. APIN, an employee resource group of DOE, collaborated with the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity to organize today's event. I'm pleased to be your MC for today, and this year's theme is Unite Our Mission by Engaging Each Other. We have a great program with guests from state government, the arts, and the technical and innovative industry to share their experiences on how we can unite and engage each other. The celebration kicks off a month of programs. Throughout this month, DOE will highlight profiles of Asian Americans who contribute to the DOE community. APIN is organizing a number of social and professional networking events as well. So please check your inboxes in the coming weeks or talk to APIN members after the program for more information on these opportunities and how to get more involved with APIN. To start our program, I would like to invite Ms. Patrice Garthorn to the stage to sing the national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets reckless the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave and now please welcome Ms. Christine Repass of the Office of Economic Diversity Good morning, everyone. I'm Kristen Arifa, Special Assistant in the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity, and I have the privilege of introducing the Director of the Office, James Campos. Director Campos was nominated by the President of the United States and confirmed by the Senate last year on April 9, 2018. As Director, Mr. Campos oversees the Office of Minority Economic Impact and the Office of Civil Rights and Diversity. He is tasked with helping to implement legislation and executive orders with an eye towards their effect on minorities in regards to education and business, as well as ensuring minorities are afforded an opportunity to fully participate in department programs. Additionally, he serves as the department's Equal, op equal Employment Opportunity Director complex-wide. Mr. Campos functions as the department's designee on various White House initiatives, such as the Educational Excellence for Hispanics, initiative to promote excellence and innovation at historically black colleges and universities, the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council, and initiative on Asian American Pacific Islanders. Please join me in welcoming Director James Campos. Thank you, Kristen. And good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2019 Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month program. This month, we celebrate the achievements. Excuse me, this fell. 
There we go. This month, we celebrate the achievements of the Asian American and Pacific Islander community in education, business, science, the arts, government, and the armed forces, which has strengthened our nation and helped define our history. These, American, these Americans bolster our economy as entrepreneurs, business owners, and employees who initiate and expand opportunities for their families, communities, and country. Their languages, art, and cuisine have enriched the American experience for all of us. Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are the fastest growing racial group in the United States, and the population is expected to be more than doubled by 2060, which is just tremendous. As the director of the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity, as the designee of the Department of the White House Initiative on Asian American and Pacific Islanders, I work to increase the AAPI community's access to and participation in programs within the Department of Energy sector and energy sectors as a whole. The Asian American Pacific Islanders community has played a vital role in the advancement of science and technology in the energy sector, and they are an integral part of the fabric of the department. I look forward to hearing from speakers Jimmy Ray and Sharon Khan, Khan, along with our panel discussion as they share their stories and perspectives related to media, the arts, and the AAPI community. First, I have the distinct honor to introduce Jimmy Ray, uh, Maryland's sec uh, Special Secretary of Small Minority and Women's Business Affairs. He was appointed by Governor Hogan in January 2015 to oversee the state's Small Business Reserve, Minority Business Enterprise, and Veteran-Owned Small Business Enterprise procurement programs across 70 agencies. With over 20 years of entrepreneurial experience in, on in enterprise creation, growth and change management, he has an extensive record of directing turnaround situations ranging from manufacturing to software companies. His career also includes four years of service as the Assistant Secretary of Commerce and Trade for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Mr. Ray serves as a board member for various organizations including Asians in Energy, Environment and Commerce, and Commerce. Additionally, he earned a Master's in Science and a Master's of Business Administration from John Hopkins University. It is a great honor to have you here today, sir. It's an honor for the department. Your work across the nation has been tremendous in Virginia and Maryland, of course, specifically. And I welcome you here today. So welcome. Thank you so much, sir. Please come up. Well, thank you, Director Campos. And I want to thank you and uh, your staff for all that you guys do to advance the uh, minority community space. Uh, economically, socially, politically, and all that you do. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> let me start off by saying this. Um, I was born and raised in South Korea. I came here when I was a teenager. And uh, back then, South Korea was very, very poor. I was telling James Campos earlier that we ranked 145th out of 148 countries that existed back then on per capita income. So. Practically speaking, first 10 years of my life, we camped out, okay? Not much infrastructure there to enjoy. Um, so when I first came to the U.S., and uh, when I first had that taste of potato chips and Coca-Cola, I thought I died and went to heaven, okay? Um, the diversity is what makes this country great, um, and yet we have so much in common. And, uh, and this, that's the reason why America is it's the greatest country on earth. Um, so let me start off by saying this. It was in 1992 that the official designation of May as Asian Pacific uh, and, um, Islanders and Desis, American Heritage Month, was signed into law to recognize the contributions and achievements of Asian Pacific Americans. And that was that's significant because if you remember, on May 6, 1882, this country passed the Chinese Exclusion Act that prevented Chinese laborers from immigrating to the U.S. and deny Chinese nationals uh, from eligibility for U.S. citizenship. And of course, during the World War II, um, this country justified internment camps for Americans of Japanese ancestry by citing Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor. 
And that was done in the name of national security, of course, yet there were no internment camps established for Americans of German or Italian ancestry. We must never forget those dark periods in our history, uh, <clears throat> where the tens of thousands of people and families were denied uh, they were racially profiled and then stripped of their basic human and legal rights. And we Asian Americans carry that lesson for generations, all the, all the while making America great. And today, we are the fastest growing minority group in the U.S. and seemingly firing on all cylinders, educationally, economically, politically, and so on. And yet, we have challenges. Um, first of such, relating to identity. Uh, it's complicated being uh, Asian Americans in this country. Even among ourselves, uh, we Asian Americans don't have much of a shared history uh, in the U.S. to really unite us. The fellow Americans think that we are too small in number, so we don't really count, and we're doing just fine anyway. Some even think that we may be doing better than white. They all say Asians are model minorities, and yet there's a consequence to that. Uh, Asian Americans remain misunderstood and therefore unrecognized and underserved in many aspects because we really haven't defined what it means to be Asian Americans. Given Asia's history, uh, our parents will remind us that Chinese and Koreans don't like Japanese too much, right? Indians and Pakistanis, they don't get along. Uh, the light-skinned Asians look down on darker-skinned Asians, and so on. On the surface, we don't really show much interest in being lumped into the same group. At the same time, many of our fellow American friends see us as a single group without a defining narrative. They see us perhaps as kung fu fighting, smart, obedient people. Uh, if you go back in time, the term Asian American was concocted 50 years ago by a few activists at UC Berkeley. Um, and they did that to gain political influence. Before that, we were simply Indian Americans, Chinese Americans, and so on. But these activists envisioned that by forming an alliance, the US government, namely the OMB, would be pressured to promote the new term Asian American from the other category with significant impact on how resources are allocated. Now, Asian Americans have benefited from that decision since, as African Americans have done the same thing, something similar much earlier, and benefited from that. The black power political movement in the 60s had that blackest, beautiful cultural movement that rejected racist perception and helped to define a more empowering narrative of what it means to be a black person in the US. Today, even many Asian Americans can recite speeches, songs, and identify influential black figures, such as Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Um, what about the Asian Americans? Can you recite some? Is there an Asian American narrative that the mainstream can relate to? Why do they still ask, where are you from globally? Um, originally, rather, despite the fact that most of Asian Americans, most of us grew up here. Many of you probably had this experience whereby a conversation with someone was about your race, a foreign language, they assume you speak, and so on. Of course, our fellow American friends don't mean to belittle or relegate us to that stereotype. They are simply underexposed to the Asian American narrative. Now, we exist in a society that sees us all as one, as all looking the same, as all being the same. And my father, uh, who passed away last year, is a person who brought Korean martial arts called Taekwondo to this country. And uh, so when I was young, I was exposed to people like Bruce Lee, Muhammad Ali, Chuck Norris. These people would come to our house and work out with my father. Um, now, Bruce Lee, especially, was one cocky man, okay? In a good way, plus he could back it up, right? Um, 
Now, he didn't buy into that Hollywood's portrayal of Asians as chop suey karate men, okay? As an Asian American, he didn't buy into that then existing Hollywood paradigm that being objectified is better than being ignored. He wanted to be embraced instead, more fully, and acted as such, rather than saying yes to anything the film, film industry asked of him and just be grateful. Uh, he was a true pioneer, uh, a one of kind. Just as Bruce Lee has done, we Asian Americans, we also need to leverage the media and scale our exposure. Perhaps the crazy rich Asians is a major step towards that, where we are the star, not the supporting actor, right? Where we define our own narrative. Um, the second generation uh, Asian Americans certainly have the tools, such as YouTube, to sidestep the institutions, such as Hollywood completely, and illuminate Asians for more empowering narrative. And I believe that's happening today. Now, otherwise, we will continue to have a situation where we are, we are objectified and stereotyped. Some years ago, my daughter, Kimberly, faced a situation in a high school, right, where her friends joked about her Asian-looking eyes. And you know what I'm talking about, right? So she cleverly replied, why do we have slanted, slanted eyes? And she said, you know, we Asians have a difficult time watching TV vertically because we can't see the whole vertically, so we have to move our head up and down like this to the TV, right? And her friends asked her, really, right? <laughs> so my daughter replied, yeah, that's the reason why we invented widescreen TV. <laughs> and then they'll reply, really, okay? <laughs> so, so perhaps you face a similar situation in your life, but this is no laughing matter, really, when you think about it. The process of defining who we are the narrative that defines us in itself is a lesson in diversity and critical thinking necessary for theory, policy, and services to fit the ever more diverse and changing, but yet still racialized society today. So challenges. There's a perception out there that Asians are doing well, and mostly true. According to Pew Research, this is because we put more value on hard work and career success than other Americans. This certainly contributed to model minority stereotype. And yet if you look at closely, Asians face many challenges. Let me show some data, okay? There are approximately 22 million of us residing in the US, about 6% of the population. 12.6% of us live below the poverty line. US average, 12.4, surprise, huh? Now, our limited English proficiency com compound the obstacles in achieving good health. Example, even though the cancer is the leading cause of Asian American women, the rate of cancer screening among Asian American immigrants, immigrant women especially, is well below that of the national average. The high school dropout among Asians, look at Southeast Asian American. It's staggering, okay? 40% of Hmong, 38% of Laotian, 35% of Cambodian populations do not complete high school. In a Gallup poll, 30% of Asian Americans reported employment discrimination, the largest of any group with African Americans constituting the second highest at 26%. Yet Asian Americans only filed about 2 to 3% of the total employment discrimination complaints received by the EEOC against private employers. Are we too obedient, too laconic? Is this the definition of model minority? Who knows? According to HUD, one in five Asian Americans experience discrimination in the rental and home buying process. That's 20% of us, okay? And I'm not even mentioning the fact that Asian Americans are the least likely group in the US to be promoted to top management in large businesses known as bamboo ceiling. Now, globalization brings another interesting set of challenges uh, to the dynamics of race, ethnicity, and culture. At individual level, for example, continuous contacts and opportunities with one's country, your country of origin, that globalization allows raises questions of your loyalty to this country politically, economically, and culturally. Now, these challenges, perhaps more intensely uh, experienced by Chinese Americans these days are only bound to increase and further complicate the already complex issue 
of race and social problems that Asian Americans face. The bottom line is this, the sad truth is always better than the happy lies, right? Uh, active and purposeful discussion of these tough challenges is important in the critical discourse on race, related social problems, including racial inequality, discrimination, and structural barriers that affect Asian Americans, individuals, and families. So going forward, there are approximately 22 million Asian Americans living in the U.S. And we came from more than 20 countries in Asia. Uh, with this growth and diversification comes new questions about what it means to be an Asian American, who belongs, and which issues to advocate for. Um, the growth in the number of Latinos who surpassed the percentage of blacks as America's largest minority, and the rise of Asian American as the fastest growing minority group, complicate traditional view of America as a portrait in black and white. Yet I'm sorry to inform you that President Obama's election did not usher in a uh, post-racial America. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems one skin color still matters, okay? As such, what Dr. King said in summer of 1963 still rings true. Remember what he said? Remember when he gave that famous I Have a Dream speech where he simply talked about what he believed? And he went around and told other people about uh, what he believed, and they went and told other people about, about what they believed to the point where he had 250 people, 250,000 people that came to hear him speak. And you have to wonder how many people came for Dr. King. Probably none. They all came for themselves. It was what they believed about America that got them to, some of them, to take that eight-hour bus ride and to stand in the hot Washington, D.C. sun in the middle of August. It was what they believed. What did Dr. King believe? He believed there are two sets of laws. Those that come from above, and you know what I'm talking about, and those that we make. And as long as those two sets of laws are incompatible with, e with each other, we'll never live in a just world. That's what he believed. Um, the gap still exists in our society, and we're still fighting to make uh, these two laws consistent with each other. And that we all have a, a joint responsibility to close the gap. Um, Someone once said, I think it was President Obama who said this, but I'm not sure, a meaningful change will never come if we wait for some other people or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change agent we've been seeking and we've been waiting for. I think that's a very important uh, statement that we have to remember. And that's what celebrating the Asian Heritage Month is all about, to remind ourselves that Asian Americans are the change agent we have been waiting for, the ones we seek to close the gap and set the path going forward. Yes, Asian American history is American history. And yes, Ameri Asian American history is a narrative permanently woven into American fabric. And as such, we designate May to illuminate and celebrate the importance of Asian American contributions. Yet, we should not limit this celebration to May. Instead, we must celebrate it every day, 24-7, 365, to set an empowering narrative that defines who we are in American fabric. This event is a perfect reminder of that endeavor, which we must all engage in. As we gather this morning, I'm optimistic that we will all work together towards that America that truly lives up to its ideals celebrates the diversity of his people and encourages all Americans to pursue their American dreams. And that's what this event is all about, to celebrate and re remind us that we Asian Americans are the change agents that we Asian Americans have been waiting for to bring about the changes that we seek. So let's get to work. Thank you so much.
this time, I'd like to invite our distinguished panel up on stage. Please welcome Ms. Crystal Lehman, Policy Director of the DOE Strategic and Interagency Initiative Team. Ms. Lehman will be our moderator today. Mr. David Yao, Director of the Asian Pacific American Film Festival. Ms. Cori Diokino, actress and founder of the Baltimore Asian Pacifica Arts Collective, and Ms. Noriko Sanefuji, museum specialist with the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, that was a wonderful speech from our keynote. Um, I thought it really resonated with me. Um, I'm actually, uh, my mother's from the Philippines. I um, was born here, but she came out here when she was about 15. So to me, it's really important to make sure that we um, remember where we came from and also empower those who are here. Um, so from, from me to you, thank you for being here and celebrating the Heritage Month. Um, and I'm so delighted to be uh, moderating this panel. Um, this panel is on rep representation in media and the arts. Um, now, who here from a raise of hands has seen a television show or a movie and felt, hey, that's me? Okay, very little. <laughs> very little. Some, but very little. Um, so, uh, recently, we've seen a little bit of a breakout in diversity in media and film and in art. Um, Black Panther, uh, Crazy Rich Asians in film. Um, so this panel is looking at how Asian, Asian American, and Pacific cultures and traditions and identity continue and are honored through media, film, print, and exhibition. Um, we want to celebrate those and highlight their importance. Um, so I would like to start off with a general question. Um, we have an impressive panel here on what are you doing now? How did you end up where you are? And what drew you to the arts? So let's start here with um, Noriko. Thank you. First of all, thank you for having us on the Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. I'm so excited to be here. So I'm Noriko. I work for the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. How I got here into the arts because I technically work for a history museum, uh, but we do carry a lot of art, different form. Uh, I was a history major, and I volunteered. I was a docent at one of the exhibition, and I thought this is amazing because we are storytellers. We're telling this uh, American history or Asian American history to the public outside of our classroom. So I thought that was fascinating, and that's how I kind of end up in this uh, business, and I really enjoy being part of the museum as a storyteller. And Corey? Hi. Um, yes, thank you for having us. Um, sorry, what were the questions again? <laughs> <laughs> how did you get where you are, and what you, drew you to the arts? Um, yeah, so I um, started off as an actress. I actually was a competitive pianist as a child. Um, I use the term competitive very loosely because I didn't actually compete. I was just trained to compete. Um, and then in college, I ended up finding theater, and I found that I liked it a lot more. Um, most of my experience was as a performer, so I focus on performance. And after college, I found myself trying to find work, and the easiest way to find work was as an after-school arts teacher, um, which is how I found my way into arts integration. And that's basically using the arts and integrating it with core curriculum, um, and using the arts to teach kids other topics like math or literacy or social studies. Um, and part of the reason why I'm so drawn to that is because um, as a child, it was so hard for me to focus. And the only way that I was able to focus on my math lesson or my li literacy lesson was if you put something else into it, something creative or something fun. Um, so for me as an educator, it's really fun to find a way to incorporate the arts into something you wouldn't find the arts in, like math. Um, and I guess how I found myself here, I ended up co-founding an organization in Baltimore called the Baltimore Asian Pacifica Arts Collective. And that really just came out of sort of serendipitous circumstance. Um, there was a situation where um, a theater company um, produced something with extreme yellow face, which is basically non-Asian people playing Asians. 
Um, and a whole bunch of us got really angry um, and responded. And the one excuse that they kept saying was, well, we tried to reach out to arts organizations that focused on AAPI identity, but we couldn't find any. And so we were like, oh, really? Um, and so we just sort of founded ourselves to say, uh, as a way to communicate, okay, well now you no, no longer have that excuse because we're here. So if you have any questions about representation, you can reach out to us. Um, that's basically how that got started, but we're really trying to expand ourselves and do other things, and so that's sort of my little journey. Thank you, Crystal, for inviting me to come on this um, panel. Um, honestly, uh, my background is quite diverse because frankly, I'm not too sure what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> uh, but my background is um, uh, I uh, had an accounting degree uh, undergraduate. I worked in a um, public accounting for a couple of years, hated it. So I switched over to doing graphics design, which my sister, older sister, said, why don't I give it a try? You've always liked drawing little doodle things when, when I was a young kid. So I did. Went to AU, uh, finished up. And then I worked for a public accounting, uh, a public relations company for, for some time. There's some very interesting pro programs, uh, a lot of government contracting um, that helped me use art to communicate a message to the general public in terms of PSAs and um, kind of health messaging, which I found very rewarding. Um, but after that, I jumped out. Uh, and then I just fell into um, working for uh, on US-China relations issues. And I've been doing that for the past so 20, 20 or so years. Uh, but somewhere inside of me, I've always had a passion to do something more. Perhaps it was the influence of watching TV um, back in the uh, early um, uh, uh, kind of the 1980s, Vincent, uh, Vincent Chin. This guy got beaten to death, and he received no due um, legal justice due representation, due process, exactly. Uh, so that, 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 that's something that has always bugged me. So when the chance came along, uh, I volunteered, or actually someone um, brought me into organizations like Organization of Chinese American to do uh, more uh, efficacy, civil rights, awareness work. And then, um, uh, uh, so I got to know the community a little bit more. And then when they, um, the, uh, the project of raising funds for the National Japanese American Memorial came up, I thought, that's great, something that I wanted to do because it's trying to right a historical wrong. And so I, I jumped in, uh, helped uh, organize some of the activities which uh, had uh, hopefully more meaning. In fact, following um, uh, Mr. Reeves' comment that during World War II, Japanese Americans were interned, but I believe there are also plans to uh, intern German and Italian Americans, <laughs> except well-known people like um, Joe, Joe DiMaggio, who's Italian American, spoke up and said, hey, not all Italian Americans are fascists, but for the Japanese American community, for, for all Asian communities, there weren't anyone well-known like that speaking up for them. So they were just like shoved into camps. And Noriko actually is well-versed in this. You actually curated a, an exhibit recently on the topic of the internment camps. Uh, yes, thank you, Crystal. So we have a, currently we have an exhibit called The Writing Around, Japanese American in World War II. It got extended, so you still have time till Which end museum? of- Which uh, museum? American History Museum. Okay. Till end of July, since you're all neighbors. Well, I'll go after this, okay. So please come by, and if you'd like to have a guided tour, feel free to call me up. I'm happy to uh, show you around. So this uh, came about uh, two years ago. There was a 75th commemoration for FDR signing the Executive Order 9066. That was February 19 of 1942. So fast forward 75 years. That was 2017. So you may know the climate back then, but uh, we opened it up. And it's been uh, pretty, uh, very, uh, it's been well reviewed. And we're having a lot of traffic. Right now it's the spring crowd, and we're going to lead into the Memorial Day in the summer. So we just have tons of uh, school groups, families are coming through. So 
That's fantastic. And it's good to know that uh, our museums here, by the way, all are free, we're so wildly lucky, um, can really represent certain aspects of our history. And that actually goes into my next question on the thoughts on how actually media and art um, impact the identity of who they represent. Um, I know Corey, as an actress, I mean, you've been doing a lot in terms of um, your performance and showcasing someone of a different identity in your, in your performance. Can you maybe speak a little bit on that and how that can, can impact the viewer? Yeah. Um, so I always refer back to a, a personal experience that I had as a kid. Um, I immigrated to the States when I was four from the Philippines. Um, and I, there wasn't a lot of Filipino representation at the time. Um, now there's a lot on TV uh, specifically. Um, but at the time, I remember I was about 14 or 15 and I was writing in my journal as one does. And I was watching TV and I remember thinking to myself, I wanna be an actress when I grow up. And then I, there was literally a mirror there. And I joke around and I say that I had a Mulan moment. <laughs> I looked at my reflection in the mirror and I thought to myself, but that's never gonna happen because I'm not white and I'm not black mm -hmm. and I don't do martial arts. Mm -hmm. And so I always reflect on that because it's amazing to me to see how far we've all actually come and how much more opportunity and representation is actually there. Um, but I do also acknowledge that there's still a long way to go. Um, so I always, whenever I talk about the importance of representation and the importance of seeing yourself reflected in pop culture particularly, it's especially important to kids, um, especially, you know, for me, I identify as an immigrant kid um, and third culture kids. When you're growing up in a foreign country and you just don't see yourself represented, it just reinforces this idea that you don't matter. Like, you came into this society, um, you're an intruder, you don't belong, and it's even more validated by the fact that you don't see yourself represented anywhere. Um, and so that's something that um, I personally try very hard to change and that I know our organization tries very hard to change is, um, is telling everyone representation matters, um, and that's across the board. Um, and I always also try to differentiate that you know, there's a difference between diversity and representation. And I don't think that that's something that a lot of people like to talk about. Um, diversity is one tiny step towards something that's even more inclusive, which is representation. Um, a lot of people, especially in theater, do something called colorblind casting, which is just, oh, we're looking for any ethnicity. Well, that's great, but what is the importance of having this particular ethnicity as this character? What's the story you're trying to tell? And so we try to encourage people to do more um, conscious casting, more um, casting that's a little bit more aware of why you're placing this person in this role. What is the story you're trying to tell? What is, what is the significance of that person's story and why do you even have to have that person in that role? So. That's a good point. Um, and on that, David, you also are involved in, in films as well. I mean, to your point about the importance of how you cast and the story behind it, I mean, we have this blockbuster Avengers movie, you have purple, you have green, you have white, you have black, but do you see very many Asian Americans in that? So it's the importance of it and the story of it too. So from your perspective, seeing and being involved in movies, what have you seen as the evolution um, and getting representation? Uh, I understand. Corey is absolutely right. Uh, having a diverse cast doesn't necessarily get the message across as the true representation of what that uh, ethnicity could mean. Uh, because um, I guess back in the even the 70s and the 80s, there are all these television series with um, like Kwai Chang Kane. Oh my God! You know, remember those? So the Kung Fu uh, and the kind of the white fa the, the yellow face uh, casting. Uh, but I still remember right after um, the Jolly Club uh, on TV, they they came for a short um, time, Vanishing Sun headed by a Chinese-American um, actor, Russell Wong. The script got a little bit stayed, but I was really surprised to see um, on, on, I guess back then, the four major channels, one of them was showing this television series headed by a Chinese guy. Oh my goodness. That was the watershed moment for me. Uh, but unfortunately, um, I guess the, the wave passed. But what I'm very happy uh, to see now is that um, more and more Asian American kids want to go into film. 
um, and they go to film school, and they come up with products, good products, uh, way beyond just the immigrant story or whatever, uh, because the movies they make always uh, ha have a whole range of subject matters. Um, you know, it's, you make movies about what you know, your personal experience growing up, uh, not being an Asian American, but just as a teenager. Uh, and uh, some of the very creative ideas. That we've seen a lot of submissions uh, that are very interesting, but obviously movie making is just not take a camera and shooting whatever you wanted to shoot, but the storytelling, the editing, a lot of stuff. Uh, a number of films didn't make it because they were really badly made, although the ideas were good. So I still encourage people to keep trying, um, but also the advantage we have now uh, compared to, say, 20 years ago, is YouTube. Mm. If, I mean, other, uh, uh, back then, it's just the, um, uh, the kind of the, the studio bosses, uh, the, the gatekeepers to the industry mm. uh, back then, and even today, still, by and large, are white Caucasians with their uh, own experience, life experiences, and where they see a product, even though it sounds like a good idea, they always go back to their own experience and ask themselves, will this sell? Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the almighty dollar is still one of the key factors. But with YouTube, at least f uh, filmmakers can put their products to show the general public, hey, my stuff, it's, it's, you, you can go see it. If you like it, let me know and okay. we'll do something. So it opens up a whole wide area for young people to, uh, coming up to That's a really use. good point. And the importance of storytelling, too. So, um, Noriko, I actually have a question for you in terms of storytelling. I mean, you, you work for the Smithsonian. How, how do you decide what stories to tell and how to tell it? Um, you have this platform, which will be nationally viewed. Um, and you can actually share that information with a lot of people from around the country that can come visit it. Before I answer that, can I piggyback on Oh, please, on yes, David? discuss. So I think the representation is most important. So when there's an all-Asian American cast, like the Crazy Rich Asian, it was a blockbuster. But just because it's Asian American doesn't always have to succeed. We can always have different kinds of movies. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of uh, pressure if it's all Asian Americans that it has to be like super good. It has to be 200%, 300%, but it doesn't have to be so. It can come in like different levels. So I just wanted to conclude that. Mm -hmm. So, but, um, so Crystal, for your Story question. Telling. Yes. So again, the representation is super important, I feel. Uh, because uh, we have, where I work, we have about three million artifacts in our collection. Can anybody guess what percentage is actually on the exhibit floors? You can just shout numbers. Wow. It's like 2%, less than 2%. So within that 2%, it's super, super uh, competitive. I don't know, it could be like Times Square or somewhere. And then among our colleagues, we have these amazing uh, projects, but we have to compete with one another. And within that, as uh, many of the people mentioned before us today was a APA is the fastest growing group. However, it's only 6%. So within that 2% of the collections, but I think the importance of keep curating, which is acquisitioning all these artifacts is really important because then you'll be on the same platform as the rest of the food group, right? Because you need to have the artifacts. So like, Mr. Ree, if there's something you kept from your father, I just wanted to have a shout out to you because back in 2003, when we did the Korean American Centennial, your father, the Grand Master, came and then he demonstrated for us. So we celebrate Korean Americans for the 100th anniversary. So things like that, we do programs, but I think people come to us because of the artifacts. We have the real thing. So the representation is really important when we have class, uh, college students, high school students come through, you want to see yourself embedded in the American history, right? If you don't see yourself, there, a lot of them get disappointed, but I think the time is changing, so we do need to do a lot of collaboration. So I guess, long story short, is we need to keep doing this, and we have so much story, we're so behind, because 
APA history is rich but so complex and also we don't have anything in common a lot of the time, language. We also fought each other, killed <laughs> each other, right? But uh, so how are you gonna tell that in the national history or national arena setting? So it's, it's just so complex, but yeah. Can I piggyback mm -hmm. off yes, of that? Yes. Yeah, um, so I recently, like literally two days ago, had this, I got an, I don't want to say I got involved, but um, someone posted something about crazy rich Asians and how much they didn't like it, which I was like, that's fine. Um, and they were an Asian, and um, one of their Asian friends chimed in, and all they said was, well, you're not Asian, so. And it was surprising to me because then all of a sudden everyone started attacking him. Like, how dare you invalidate her comment? All she said was she didn't like it and you saying she's not Asian and she won't get it. Like, you're just invalidating her opinion. And I was just, I sat there and I was like, whoa. Like, he had a completely valid point. Um, and I always, whenever I see situations like that, I always wonder to, my, I always wonder to myself, if this was a movie about black culture and someone were to say that and everyone attacked them, what would we do? Because I think in a lot of times, for whatever reason, when it comes to Asian culture, we don't get a say in our own stories and we don't get to, for whatever reason, we don't have permission to call people out um, when we say, well, our representation matters and this is why we like this story. All of a sudden, when we speak up, it's invalidating another person's opinion. And I ended up chiming in and I basically had to break down, like, scene by scene, why this movie mattered. And I think one of the things that they said was, I didn't understand the point of Ken Jeong's character because he was so over the top. And I was like, well, I understand your point. However, I'm going to explain why this character was actually very meaningful for us and how it was very personal for a lot of us. And at the end of it, my friend actually thanked me for breaking it down. And my end point was just like, look, I get it. If, if, if you're not Asian, you don't get it. And that's not us trying to invalidate your opinion. It's just fact. Like, there's a limitation to how much we can empathize with one another and how much understanding we have to each other's personal experiences. And I think that it's important for us to acknowledge that having a movie like this is a big deal, especially if it's just a basic romantic comedy. It had all of these different layers. And I said, the fact that I'm actually on someone else's Facebook explaining the layers to this movie is a big deal because I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do that otherwise. And it just sort it emphasizes the importance of a movie like Crazy Rich Asians because to other people who aren't a part of the culture, and it's not even about all Asians, it's specifically about East Asians. Mm -hmm. The part about that movie that I understood was the part about being American and the part about her going back home and experiencing extreme culture shock, thinking that she was going to fit in with the culture around her, and it turned out that she didn't, and everyone looked down on her. And so I actually understood the part about that where I'm not 100% American, but I'm not even 100% Filipino because neither culture completely understands where I'm coming from. So that was actually the part about Crazy Rich Asians that I got and the different varieties of third culture kids that you have. You have the kids that grew up in rich families that went to boarding school or that grew up in British homes or that are immigrants or raised by immigrant parents. So there's a there's a very various layers, layers to that movie. Um, and so for me, hearing about representation and talking about movies, it's so important to see those movies get made, even if they're not going to win an Oscar, even if they don't earn a whole lot of money, because it opens up the doors for us to have conversations about our identity. Um, and it helps us to create and build bridges to cultural understanding between communities. Um, so yeah. I really enjoyed that, but I also enjoyed the portion that Devin mentioned too about the outlets, because Movies is a big budget. That's, that requires a lot of investment. How are we getting other people to be out in front? We have the Smithsonian, we have movies, we have YouTube. What are some other thoughts in order to, um, to really emphasize, not emphasize, but to be able to, to showcase the culture without having to have this investment? Well, the, the, uh, in that respect, um, we as a community, uh, well, uh, I guess by and large, and as well as individuals, I believe one of the things that we have to do better is to outreach uh, to the, well, for better, lack of a better term, mainstream America. 
uh, I don't know whether it's in our <laughs> Asian DNA that a lot of times we just, uh, when the push comes to shove, we just remain silent. Mm. So it's imperative for us to say something like what you did, which is terrific. And um, when uh, I, I guess some, someone makes some disparaging uh, comment, uh, whether they knew it or not, one should have the guts, I guess, for us to say, hey, that's not right, and this is why, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have to put ourselves, bring ourselves out of our own comfort zone because socially, um, how many of us join uh, memberships of, say, museum um, memberships or uh, go to the symphony and join the membership, stuff like that? Um, relatively few because when I go to some of these membership meetings, the big majority are Caucasians. And you can count on one hand how many Asians there are and how many African Americans there are. And it's really sad, very disappointing. Um, so I believe one of the things that we have to do is look in ourselves. What can we do to put ourselves out there better? What can I do to put myself out uh, there to better represent myself, but also my culture? Um, but what you're following and what you're saying is um, in mid-March, uh, the film festival, we brought Adele Lim uh, to Washington, D.C. She's a screenwriter for Crazy Rich Asians. She basically created that story adapted from the book and gave it a couple of twists. And, you know, uh, and this is her, her big moment. Uh, but <laughs> interesting, uh, I mean, f what Adele said was, um, first of all, as an Asian American woman, it's very difficult to break into that industry as a screenwriter. And in fact, uh, it's difficult to do that uh, in the creative arts area because you don't have someone to bring you in. Uh, because people bring in their buddies, people they grew up with and uh, whom they know. And if the power structure right now are by and large Caucasians, they will bring in other Caucasians. I just said for Adele, she got lucky. She got a break. And once uh, in, uh, her, she got her foot in the door, she just flew. Mm -hmm. And now she has this. So the, the thing is, um, for us uh, at the film festival, we want to highlight the creative talents behind the making of a movie. And we had her speak at the Bethesda Writer Center, which is, well, a, a, a very a, a wonderful organization. But most people who go there are Caucasians. So what? So I put Adele there to show them that an Asian American woman can make it big because she has talent. Mm -hmm. And this is what we have to show, put our own talents out there for people to, to know and to understand. So I'm getting the time, but before we end this panel, I just want to make sure, um, my last question is, what is one item that you would like folks from this audience to take away? from your experience in, in this industry. Um, so we'll start with, oh, she's thinking. <laughs> Corey? One topic. Just one item you want, you want folks to just remember. Um, I mean, going back to storytelling, um, stories matter. Um, you know, that's the biggest reason why I went into theater, why I went into filmmaking, is so that we could have an opportunity to create platforms for everyone to tell their stories. Um, and I don't, again, going back to the, the conversation of YouTube, is we have this incredible opportunity in, in, in social media and pop culture in which pretty much anyone at this point can be a filmmaker. I mean, I have like eight-year-old students that, I mean, they know apps so well. And I literally watched an eight-year-old make a 45-minute comedic clip. And they sat there and showed me how they edited it, how they um, like cut it up, added in music, added in voice dubbing. And she had like a 30, 45 second clip that was hilarious. And we have this amazing opportunity with technology and with the internet to actually give people, empower people to tell their stories in, in a variety of ways. Um, and, I, and this is why I love arts integration is because I'm watching teachers actually start to do this. Is I mean, I had a third grade teacher 
he had his kids write a rap about math and then he went videotaping them on his cell phone and then posted it on social media and they thought it was like the coolest thing. Um, and so I think we have this opportunity and I think we just have to utilize it more. Um, you know, I think the, the time of big budget films, I think it's slowly coming. I don't want to say to an end because movies will always be there, but it's, it's, it's um, significance, I think, is starting to wane. And I think that that's important for us. And I think that now is the time for us to really start empowering our youth and empowering their parents to encourage them to tell their stories. And I think that that goes a lot. I mean, this is, if this was a longer conversation, we could talk about immigrant culture as well. But, um, but I think now is the time for us to start empowering the younger generations to take these tools and actually use them productively and for positive, uh, in positive ways, so. Oh, uh, <laughs> Corey, um, can you pass me that kid's name? I'd like to take a look at the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds really interesting. Um, but before I jump to my, my last point, just a quick plug. Uh, the film festival, May 31st through June 2 at the Navy Memorial Theater. Um, we'll be posting up the uh, full run of the program, um, I guess, in the next couple of days. So please come, uh, put your put, put, uh, put, uh, vote with your dollar, as it were. So, uh, but enjoy the film. So we'll have a, a great line, great great lineup of short movies, anything from 10 to 15 minutes to um, about an hour long. So it's it's it's. Uh, different themes, uh, check it out. But anyway, just going to one, my one point is May APA month is great. It gives us a little bit of focus and a little bit of pat on the, pat on the back for ourselves. But please remember that outreach and to make yourself known to the community and for the community to get to know you, it's a 24, 350 day thing. It goes on year round. Just keep plugging away and something might just build up to, uh, to a, a big wave that um, could carry, move ourselves forward because, well, uh, rising tide carry lift our boats. So along, along that line uh, with my two panelists, you matter, your story really matters. So please continue to share your narratives. So because everybody has a unique narrative to tell. Mm -hmm. So that's how. <laughs> Wonderful way to end. Please give a large round of applause to the panelists. So I'd like to thank everyone for a, a great, great panel. We truly appreciate it. It's, uh, it's an important time that uh, we get here at the DOE to, to see all the contributions that so many different groups provide, and the Asian Americans are no different. And, and the cultural aspect that you provide today was greatly appreciated. It's something that we all need to know a little more about. One thing we haven't mentioned, though, is since we are the Department of Energy, the great contributions that Asian Americans provide to the energy sectors and the department as a whole is tremendous. You're increasing. Asian Americans generally are increasing with their participation in the energy sector, but also with the Department of Energy. And it's very, very vital for our national security and our vi viability and stability as a country moving forward. So very much appreciated. Thank you so much. Now I have the distinct honor of introducing Mr. Khan, the Director of External Affairs at Microsoft Corporation. Mr. Khan has previously served on Capitol Hill and at the Department of Transportation, where he was awarded the Secretary's Team Award in 2005 and the Secretary's Gold Medal for Outstanding Achievement in 2007. Additionally, in 2014, Mr. Khan was appointed to serve on the RNC's Asian Pacific American Advisory Council. Mr. Khan has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of California at Berkeley and a JD from the University of Iowa. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Khan. Thank you, James, and thanks to all of you for coming this afternoon to spend some time to discuss uh, some of the important issues that uh, our country is facing, particularly for the Asian American community, but really for all communities across our country. I know I'm the last speaker before lunch, so I will try to be brief. I just wanted to really tell you a little bit about my experience, which I'm sure will resonate with many of you and your uh, life experiences, particularly for yourselves and your families, and also give you three quick takeaways um, that, again, I think uh, might be helpful uh, for each of you. 
uh, as we think about our role as Americans in this very vibrant and diverse country. Uh, as has been said uh, by some of the previous panelists, um, you know, the Asian American experience is unique, but not so unique when it comes to the American experience. My father uh, was an immigrant from India. He arrived uh, in New York City in 1965 and took a Greyhound bus to uh, the booming metropolis of Laramie, Wyoming, uh, and began uh, his, uh, his uh, pursuit of education. He was the uh, only child in his family to finish high school. Uh, he grew up in a very poor family. He used to uh, study by kerosene lamp. Um, we used to laugh and later we would cry when we heard that when he was studying as a child in India uh, because of the poverty, at one time he fell asleep because he could only study. Um, unlike the Asian cliche, his parents didn't want him to study, didn't want him to go to school. They wanted him to work as soon as he was 10 or 12 years old. Um, but he had this, this, this yearning for education and so he would study late at night after he finished all his work and chores and one time he tipped over the kerosene lamp and lit him, his hair on fire and survived that luckily to go on to finish high school, come to the United States, pursue uh, higher education, eventually getting a PhD in, in physics uh, and working first in the nuclear uh, industry, so very fitting that we're at the Department of Energy, uh, and then later on in, the, in uh, the defense industry, which took him first to Colorado where, where he met my mother was also an immigrant from India. She came to the United States in 1968, and I was born in Colorado when they were finishing their education at the University of Colorado. And then eventually they moved to California where I grew up. Uh, my mother worked in the medical uh, uh, field, and my father first in, in, uh, in defense, then aerospace, and then eventually in what we now know as the Silicon Valley. Um, I'm the oldest of five children. And you know the old joke is in the Amer Asian American culture, at least when I was growing up, my parents would say you could be whatever you want to be as long as you're either a doctor or an engineer. And um, so I broke my parents' heart when I said I wanted to be a lawyer. And uh, uh, David will be pleased to know that was strictly because I had a steady diet of lots of TV and film. And there I saw that these lawyers uh, were doing amazing things in the courtroom whether it was Perry Mason reruns where Perry Mason would find out who really did the murder the last you know, uh, minute after the commercial break, or it was LA Law in the 80s where these really you know, fancy attorneys were driving nice cars and having all kinds of fancy lunches and doing crazy things. Um, that just really inspired me, not only from the glamour, but really also from the, the sense that my parents instilled in me that as immigrants and children of immigrants that we are lucky to be Americans, lucky to be here, but that we also have with that fortune of being an American that we have responsibilities, not only to ourselves, to better ourselves and to take our privileges seriously, but also to pull other uh, individuals around us, whether it's our family members, our, our neighbors, our community members, or indeed those around our country up with us as we continue to su su succeed and take advantage of the opportunities that the American uh, experience gives all of us uh, if we we're only willing to try. Um, and so I decided to become a lawyer and then eventually in my, through my experiences in undergrad and in law school I thought uh, public service, government and public service would be something I was interested in. Uh, came to Capitol Hill to serve uh, for my, uh, as a legal counsel for my hometown congressman on Capitol Hill. Had amazing experiences there for five years working in, uh, in and around Congress being on the floor for important legislation getting passed, working with members from all over the country, from both sides of the aisle, various backgrounds. It really instilled in me how great our democracy is, where you had literally members of Congress who were PhDs uh, to people that had no high school diplomas, that they were working together. You had actors, you had sports figures, you had lawyers, of course, med uh, doctors, dentists, businessmen, uh, immigrants. Uh, from all over the country who were working together to represent their constituents, but indeed to represent our country. And that really inspired me to stay here in Washington, D.C., to continue to serve, as many of you do, in government uh, as representatives of your, represent of your particular communities, but also as public servants uh, and just the, the, the nobility of public service that sometimes uh, can be denigrated in popular culture, can sometimes be the butt of a joke, but for those of you who are working it every day, you know that there is honor, there is uh, 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 a nobility to what we do uh, in serving our country day in and day out. So that's something that really inspired me when I was on Capitol Hill. As was said 
by James in, in his introduction. I then went on to work uh, for George W. Bush, first in the White House doing outreach, including to the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, and then to work for two cabinet secretaries, including Norman Mineta, who, as was referenced uh, earlier by Noriko, was one of the 120,000 uh, individuals who were uh, interned during World War II in one of the darker moments of our nation's history when FDR did sign that executive order in February of 1942 and imprisoned not only uh, over 100 plus thousand Americans of Japanese ancestry, but we also went to South America and Central America and brought over forcibly uh, Central and South Americans of Japanese ancestry and interned them in places like Cody, Wyoming and in Texas and in so many other parts of the central part of our United States. And eventually, of course, that generation produced the 442nd uh, Regiment uh, that served with not only with honor and distinction, but was one of the highest recognized uh, regiments for bravery in World War II fighting against the uh, Nazi Germans in uh, Italy and produced so many people, including uh, the late Senator Enoue, who represented Hawaii as, as a U.S. Senator. Um, so I was honored to work for Secretary Mineta and then Mary Peters uh, at the Department of Transportation, and then I left government in 2009. Uh, for those of you are political, you know that wasn't by choice. Um, and I went into the private sector where I serve now the, as the Director of External Affairs at Microsoft Corporation. Um, my experience is not unique. It's uh, so similar to many of you, as we've already heard, parents who were striving, parents that were willing to take a risk, many of you that were willing to take a risk, to leave your home countries, to come here to a foreign land and embrace the opportunities, but also the challenges that one faces being an immigrant, being the children of immigrant, uh, immigrants, being the grandchildren of immigrants. We, we heard already about the, the challenges of culture, of language, of race, ethnicity, religion. And these are challenges that I'll say are not unique to the Asian American experience. If you look at history throughout our history, so many communities, whether they be the African American community, Catholics, both Irish Americans, Italian Americans, Germans, the Jewish community from various parts, particularly of Central Europe, uh, and immigrants from Africa and other places that came here subsequently, um, they have faced different paths of challenge and opportunity. Some of them horrific uh, with the African American experience of slavery or the Japanese American experience of internment. Of course, we, it was discussed already um, by Mr. Ri about the Chinese Exclusion Acts uh, in my home state of California where Chinese Americans were not considered citizens even though they were born here in the United States. They could not own property. They didn't have standing to sue in court. And indeed, they weren't considered uh, full, full people for all intents and purposes. And so many other communities, uh, religious, ethnic, and otherwise, have faced challenges. But the one thing I can say that, that there is in common is eventually uh, the American experience recognized those wrongs and in some cases continues to recognize those wrongs and we're grappling with the legacy of those challenges and we're working towards really bringing together, as we say, e pluribus unium, the one of many, bringing those different cultures, religions, uh, backgrounds, ethnicities, languages together to represent one America. And that's a work in progress. The American dream is never completed. As Dr. King said, it's a promissory note that we're all working together to try to cash and to make real. And that's something that's both a challenge but also an inspi inspiration for at least me personally as we grapple with the many challenges that we do individually and uh, as Americans. The three lessons that I wanted to bring to you was the first, as I mentioned, that each community has their story. And it may be different, but there are similarities. And we're continuing to, to engage in those stories and to deal with those challenges, but to embrace those opportunities. The second I wanna, uh, point I want to make is the difference between assimilation and integration. When I was growing up, we used to use the term the melting pot, that America is a great melting pot. As a matter of fact, Henry Ford uh, was known to bring, he was well known for a lot of things, including, of course, uh, the, the design and the implementation of the, of the assembly line and the, uh, uh, the uh, invention of the Model T that brought uh, vehicles within the economic reach of the average American. He was also known for racism uh, and anti-Semitism. But one of the things that he did was, in, at least on paper, embrace the idea of the American melting pot. And he would bring all his, he would ask his employees that came from all over the world to dress in their ethnic garb on one particular day. And he had a big metal pot 
that he would ask them to literally go into and come out wearing what he considered American clothing, a suit, a dress that was American, more of a standard traditional American. And that, at least he was in that small way trying. But I would, what I would make as a distinction, and rather than assimilation, which means you need to give up your background, your ethnicity, your language, your culture, is integration. That your uh, background, whatever that might be, can be an integral part and be a very holistic part of the American whole. And I think that trend is occurring in our society, and I think that's a positive one. But I think that distinction should be sometimes made overtly, that we as Americans, particularly Americans of various backgrounds, are embracing the idea of integration rather than assimilation. We don't have to give anything up, but we can, in fact, embrace our new American identity, and that can be one with our American brothers and sisters. And the final uh, lesson that I wanted to uh, at least uh, share with you from my personal experience is that, um, that the country is unique, that America is unique, that we are an exceptional nation. If you have an opportunity to, to travel around the globe, as I've been blessed to, you find that there are amazing places and cultures and people to meet as we, as we are able to see uh, traveling the various content, continents. But the more I travel, at least I'll just speak on my own behalf, the more I am so grateful to be an American. And I'm so grateful for the risks that my parents took, like many of you and your parents or you yourselves uh, took to come here and to embrace uh, the freedoms that our American uh, experience brings forth to all of us. And that, that idea of American exceptionalism sometimes is to throw away a line in a political speech or something that might be something very esoteric or philosophical for some in a political science class. But for me, it's very real. That is, again, while we have had our challenges, slavery, discrimination, of bias, both against those of different ethnicities, against women, against people of different culture and languages, that we are a, a country that strives, based on our US Constitution, to overcome those, those darker periods of our American history. And as we continue to grapple with those challenges, I'm hopeful, uh, as has been said earlier by previous speakers, and optimistic that we will continue to make progress as Americans with the Constitution as our, our guiding document and with people like yourselves who are serving in government, serving the, uh, the public uh, for the better of our country, particularly bringing your various backgrounds to bear to the American experience, I'm confident that as we continue to take on these challenges, we as Americans can do so united. Uh, we can do so inspired by, our, by the experience of so many before us. And we can continue to make history as Americans, regardless of what our race, religion, gender, or background, but united as one America. So thank you for the time. I look forward to seeing and meeting some of you after the program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Khan, for sharing your experience, particularly your point about integration of Asian American and Pacific Islanders to make a united America. To give today's closing remarks, please welcome Ms. Patricia Zarate, Deputy Director of the Office of Civil Rights and Diversity. Good afternoon, whether you're joining us here in person or across the enterprise remotely, I, I think you'd agree that you found today's program both insightful and inspirational from Secretary Rees' comments about uh, perhaps Asian American Pacific Islanders remaining misunderstood as, uh, as individuals and having uh, different identities and different histories and perhaps people still, um, I could use some more work in, in, in exploring those differences um, among the AAPI community. So Secretary Rhee, I, I appreciate your insight and, and, and uh, inspiration there. To our panel's discussion about representation in the media and how important it is uh, to be able to tell a story and to be able to connect with the audiences, but have a true and authentic story in looking at casting roles and, and 
uh, the role that each of our panelists has played in the media and the arts and the work that they continue to do uh, to tell the AAPI story, um, both on a broad level and an individualized level through the different exhibits that Noriko works on at the Smithsonian or the work that David does um, and the work that Corey does uh, and the work that Corey does with the AAPI community and you know, the kid that you spoke about and that story. So we appreciate the, the insight in your personal stories and experiences in working with representation in the media. So, so thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, to Suhail's comments about his own personal story, uh, the risk that his parents took as immigrants to this country, uh, the, um, what they instilled in him in terms of the, the motto of responsibility both to self but also to pull other people up when you have the opportunity. And I think uh, many people try to live by that motto. Uh, but that is a reminder of uh, the great risk that people take to come to this country to, to have those experiences, uh, but maintaining their identity in terms of integration and, and maintaining your identity and, and exposing other people to your backgrounds, um, but not losing that as an important piece of you. So I thank all of the speakers and panelists for their contributions today. I also want to thank the equity and diversity team. Uh, we often say at these programs that it really does take a team to, to put these events on. Um, and there's a lot of coordination that happens both with the ERG, in this case, APEN, um, and the speakers. And so I want to thank, uh, take the time to thank Mike Colbert, um, who's back here hiding, <laughs> who, who was our lead for today's program, and Colette Bankins, who's actually on detail to ED from EM, who really helped, uh, uh, helped and stepped in with logistics and, and support where it was needed in, in bringing this program together. Um, and Manny Rosales for, for helping to identify the great speakers that, that we had today and APEN for helping to identify the, the great panelists that we had today. So it really does take a team to bring these events together and we appreciate everyone collaborating with each other and working together to help us have a successful program. I've been asked to make one um, comment in case people aren't aware of this. This is Public Ser Service Recognition Week. And so the Department of Energy has a calendar of events happening both at headquarters and across the complex that can be found on Powerpedia um, with the Workplace Improvement Network area on Powerpedia. And Melody Bell um, is our lead on that. And she did indicate that Wynn has had a table further down on the ground floor by the elevator bank. So if you're interested in finding out more information, you can visit the wind table or you could go to the Powerpedia page to, to learn about the calendar of events. Um, and one final thing, a very important thing, we're having the food tasting immediately following this event in 1E245. But before we conclude, we want to recognize our speakers um, with either a plaque or a certificate and We'll go ahead um, and ask Secretary Reed to come up. Ann, do you want to come up? And I'll invite Ann Augustin up, the Principal Deputy Director of the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity. Uh, Secretary Reed's plaque reads, uh, for your appreciation for your outstanding support in recognition of the 2019 Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month observance, Unite our mission by working together held on May 7th, 2019 at the Department of Energy. As a state of Maryland special secretary of small minority and women business affairs, we appreciate your expert knowledge and contribution to this year's program, honoring the achievements of the AAPI community, both in, well, in business, media, arts, and the community. Your standard of excellence serves as a sterling example for the federal government and the nation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if I could ask Suhel Khan to please return to the stage. 
His Appreciation Award reads for your outstanding support and recognition of the 2019 American Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month observance, Unite Our Mission by Working Together, held on May 7, 2019 at the Department of Energy. As the Director of External Affairs at the Microsoft Corporation, we appreciate your expert knowledge and contribution to this year's program, honoring the achievements of the AAPI community in business, media, arts, and the community. Your standard of excellence serves as a sterling example for the government and the nation. We also, sure. <laughs> I have to be a little careful there. Um, if we could have Crystal Lehman come up, I want to thank you for agreeing to be our moderator today and, and doing such a great job with that and in keeping the dialogue going. This is a certificate of appreciation that reads in recognition of your outstanding support of the 2019 Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month observance. Unite our mission by engaging each other held on May 7th at the Department of Energy. Your insights and contributions to the panel discussion were instrumental to the success of the program. The department thanks you for a job well done and wishes you continued success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if I could have Noriko Sanefuji come back to the stage. We have a similar certificate of appreciation uh, that thanks Noriko for the insights and contributions on the panel. We appreciate your willingness to come out to the Department of Energy and to be part of that panel. And we wish you continued success. Thank you. Whatever your ethics rules require. <laughs> and Corey Dioquino, if we could ask you to return to the stage. And we also have a certificate of appreciation for you that reads similarly, and, and we thank you for your insights and, and contributions on the panel, and uh, thank you for the job well done, and wish you continued success. And David, would you mind coming back to the stage? We have a certificate of appreciation for David Yao. Um, again, we thank you for your participation on the panel, agreeing to come to DOE to be part of this program, and we wish you continued success. Thank you. That concludes the program. The food tasting, if you're in the Forestall building, is in 1E245, and we'll see you there. Thank you so much for coming today. <laughs>